Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 199 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. Yes, it's episode 199, which means that next week makes 200 episodes of the Medieval Podcast. Pretty unbelievable. Stay tuned until the end of this episode to find out how you can help me celebrate. But first, a very awesome episode just for you. During the 14th century, warfare began to change in Western Europe. The rise of gunpowder created a surge in experimentation with weapons and chemical combinations, creating a whole array of cannons with increasingly powerful capabilities. But how do we trace the evolution of the cannon? And is every gunpowder recipe actually effective? This week, I spoke with Dr. Clifford J. Rogers about cannons, gunpowder, and how you test them in the modern world. Cliff is a professor of history at West Point Military Academy and the author and editor of several books and countless articles on military history, including Soldiers' Lives Through History, the Middle Ages, the West Point History of Warfare, and the Oxford Encyclopedia of Medieval Warfare and Technology. He's the winner of numerous awards, some more than once, including the Royal Historical Society Alexander Prize Medal, the Society for Military History's Moncado Prize and Distinguished Book Award, the Department of the Army Commander's Award for Public Service Medal, and the Commander's Award for Civilian Service Medal. Cliff is also the co-founder and co-editor of the Journal of Medieval Military History. Our conversation on his gunpowder experiments how small variations might affect each recipe, and why a modern military academy needs a medievalist is coming up right after this. Well, thank you, Cliff, for joining me to talk about all things medieval military history. It is a pleasure to talk to you. I'm happy to be here. Well, I came across one of your papers. I think I've been attending your papers for close to 10 years. I almost never miss them because the research that you do is so precise and I think it is so responsible. So congratulations on all the research you've been doing. But the paper, (laughs) you're welcome. Well, the paper that I was thinking of talking to you about for the podcast was the one that you did on cannons. Actually, there's two papers, I think, that were relevant. One was on how cannons were loaded. I think that was a work that you were doing. And one was on gunpowder. So let's start with cannons. You've done a lot of work on the Hundred Years War, and this is when cannons start to become part of warfare. Can you give us a little overview of how cannons came to be part of Western European warfare and where they went? Sure. So gunpowder, as it's usually defined, which is just a mix of, of charcoal and saltpeter and sulfur, actually probably came from China via India and was known in Europe by the 13th century. But that's just actually sort of a linguistic flaw because we call that stuff gunpowder before it was used in guns. And really it was rocket powder. So that the gunpowder recipe exists in the 13th century in Europe, but there aren't any guns until the 14th century. And basic difference being that, of course, a rocket, the gunpowder propels what it's coming from, and a gun, it throws something out. Mm -hmm. And so the earliest recipe that we have for actual gunpowder that that says it's meant to be used in a gun rather than for flying fire or something like that comes from 1336, which is just before the Hundred Years' War, like one year before the Hundred Years' War. But already for then, guns were around for a decade. The earliest mention we have of them actually being used on a campaign is 1327, which is actually the first year that Edward III, who was, of course, the the leading figure of the Hundred Years' War in the first phase, his first campaign when he was 16 years old, there were cracks of wear, which is cracks of war, which uh, we know from a manuscript were actually war guns that shot lances. So for a hundred years after that, they steadily got bigger and bigger and more powerful and more numerous. And that was based on really just trying to throw bigger and bigger stones, or the small ones tended to fire like lead pellets or or iron pellets, but the big ones threw stones until the 15th century. And they went from firing like a fist-sized stone to stones that were literally over a ton. So just 80 centimeter stone balls. They didn't throw them very fast compared to like a modern cannon, but they still threw them about as fast as like a crossbow bolt or maybe even twice as fast as a crossbow bolt, depending on the gun. 
And when you throw something that weighs a ton at the speed of a crossbow bolt, that just is when you start to get to the level of being able to actually knock down a pretty well-made castle wall. So they had that great big gun. That would have been the biggest one would have been around 1415. And then from then to about 1430, they actually started to make them smaller, but more strongly built so that they had a higher charge of gunpowder relative to the ball so that they could shoot the ball faster. And uh, the formula for kinetic energy is one half MV squared. So if you cut the size of the stone in half, but you double the velocity, you actually double the impact. And it's also just the smaller gun is easier to move around. They were having problems up till then where, you know, along the route, they would have to stop and rebuild bridges so that the 24 oxen could get across and pull the gun and it wouldn't collapse the bridge, that kind of thing. So they started going to guns that were a little smaller and only through stones of three or 400 pounds, but through them more powerfully. And that was also partly because of better gunpowder. So more and better gunpowder. And that caused a sort of a tipping point where in the 1410s, you could knock down a castle wall with a big gun, but they fired very slowly. I don't mean in the velocity of the stone, I mean in how long it took to load and fire them. One gunner in the 15th century managed to, according to a chronicle anyway, managed to hit three different targets all in one day with his bombard. (laughs) And because of that, his commander decided he must be in league with the devil and forced him to go on a pilgrimage to Rome. (laughs) But typically you might fire a gun like that, you know, six, seven, eight times a day, which isn't very many. And so even though you could do a lot of damage with each shot in between, the defenders would basically be repairing the wall. And so it could reach a, a bit of a stalemate, or at least it would take a long time to actually create a breach. By the 1430s, you had more guns, even though they weren't shooting larger stones, they were shooting more powerfully with more gunpowder and better gunpowder and longer barrels that captured more of the force of the gunpowder. And you got to a point where you could actually knock down castle walls fairly quickly and reliably, or at least you know make breaches in them. Now, even a castle wall with a big hole in it is still not nothing and it's still dangerous to attack it. So that would often then lead to a negotiated surrender, but it really changed the whole balance between offense and defense by that point. So these early cannons, were they mostly used in siege warfare? So they're mostly being fired at a building and not at a crowd of people? Correct. They are mostly used for siege warfare. They are used in the field in battles also, but they're just not very effective at that. Now, actually, to be a little more precise, the early ones are not actually being fired at castles or towns. They're usually being fired into towns. So lobbing stones over the walls where they would probably hit a building, but you weren't necessarily targeting any particular building. You were just throwing a big stone into the city just to make life miserable for the people inside and encourage them to surrender more rapidly. (laughs) I think that would work if you're looking up and all of a sudden seeing a 300-pound stone coming down. I would want to get out of the way. I'd want to get out of the siege. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And of course, every day that a siege lasts is very expensive for the besieger. And by the time of the Hundred Years' War, you're paying your army. And so that's a lot of guys you're paying, and every day costs a lot of money. So if you can speed that up by giving the defenders an incentive, it's a really good investment, even though the guns were very expensive. Yes, yes, I imagine. And one of the challenges that you mentioned in this paper I heard a while back was that it's very hard to imagine cannons in some ways because there aren't that many that still exist. Why don't they still exist? Well, a lot of them do exist once you get sort of past the period of the 1415s. It's the first hundred years, essentially, that very few exist. A lot of them were made with bronze. So as cannon designs developed, they tended to get melted down because you just melt them down and recast them in, you know, maybe several smaller guns and you build one bigger one. And the ones that weren't made of, uh, of bronze were made of iron, which of course tends to rust. They get corroded. And as people started developing better, more powerful gunpowder, they also had a problem with a lot of guns bursting. You see that a lot in the early uh, 15th century. So a burst 
gun is not something you're going to keep. So there, there are there are a substantial number that are still out there, but not compared to what you might like. And the ones that do exist, most of them are not dated. So when, when later they get to the ha- into the habit on the cast bronze guns, that they'll have you know decoration in the casting, and that will often actually include the year the gun was cast. But uh, for the medieval period, that's very rare, not quite unheard of, but very rare. So most of the guns that are still around, you can't necessarily know when they were made. You can try and sort of match what they look like to manuscript illustrations, or you can look at the proportions, you know, what's the ratio between the volume of the powder chamber and the volume of the barrel and how long is the barrel and all that kind of stuff and compare that to documentary evidence. And you can say, okay, this this is the same ratio as you see in this purchase document from 1409. So these are probably the same, but you never really know. <laughs> yes. uh, not never, actually. Occasionally, you know, for example, Mons Meg at the Castle of Edinburgh, we actually have the whole set of accounts about its manufacture because that's such a big, big gun that a lot of money went into it. And so the records are, were kept. Yeah, that is a massive beast of a cannon. <laughs> it is. It is. Can't imagine that's trying to pull the... that across a bridge. <laughs> yeah. So you were mentioning that one of the ways that you find out about this stuff is by looking at manuscript images. And you're also talking mm-hmm. about the distance, the ratios, velocity. Do you ever look at accounts of battles and try and figure out if they were shooting it from here and it damaged the thing they said it damaged, this might yeah. be the size of the gun? Is that work that you do too? Well, so that doesn't tell you the size of the gun because, you know, you could have a big gun or a small gun and they might both shoot about the same distance, a a different size stone. But yeah, I I have done that. Actually, let's see, I think the first fairly specific record of a gun being shot, you know, a description of a gun being shot is from 1340 when a town council in the Low Countries heard about the neighboring t- city had a had a gun and they had the the gunsmith come over to demonstrate and he was supposed to shoot at the town gate basically to demonstrate what he could do and the shot went over the gate and actually killed some incredibly unlucky person <laughs> at a plaza in the middle of the the city you know so it way overshot we know which plaza it was we know from you know, 17th, 18th century maps, where the wall was, where the plaza is. So yeah, I did actually use that. And that didn't give me a precise answer because I don't know exactly where the shot started, but you can calculate the arc and know that it must have been at least a certain distance to get over the gate and then keep going and and hit at that spot. Yeah, this is painstaking work. (laughs) It's it's very painstaking work. I applaud you. And there's so many problems with So as I said, we have these financial records that tell us things like what the weight of bronze that went into a gun was, because it was they were often purchased at a set price per pound. But a pound is not a pound is not a pound is not a pound, right? Every place in Europe had its own different pound. So certain places were well known and their pound was well known. But okay, here's this little village over here. Probably they were using the pound of this city that's over there. And I can look in 18th century manuals. Actually, it's the best place because, you know, those traditional weights st- stayed the same basically up to the French Revolution. And so shortly before the French Revolution, there were merchants. They want to buy bronze in Augsburg. They need to know how much is an Augsburg pound compared to a Paris pound. So there are books that have just tables uh, of that information but it definitely adds a lot of complication. And sometimes you don't know. I mean, sometimes it just says a pound and you don't know where the document is from or you know, there's a gunsmith brought in from one town to work in another town. Is he talking about his home pound or his local pound? You do what you can. <laughs> exactly, you do what you can. Make a lot of charts, a lot of tables for all mm-hmm. of the possibilities. Mm-hmm. So one of the things you were working on was different gunpowder recipes, which I think is related to the, you know, how much is a pound and how much are we adding together? Why do we need to look at this? Like, why not just say gunpowder is gunpowder? Why is it important to look at this, these ratios? 
we have a lot of actual gunpowder recipes from this period, and they're pretty different from one another and from, from modern proportions. They tend to have more sulfur than modern gunpowder, and they do tend by the end of the Middle Ages to sort of stabilize on something that's pretty close to the modern proportions. But if you look at them, some of the earliest recipes actually seem, you know, if you just look at the, the numbers, it would seem like, hey, they went from something pretty close to modern powder to something pretty far away from modern powder, and then back to something that's pretty close. So that sort of poses the question of, did they know what they were doing is kind of the core question. Because at first glance, it looks like they didn't. And so people might think, oh, yeah, sure, you know, some new alchemical philosophy was applied or just medieval people weren't very smart or, you know, that kind of thing. So what I've been doing at West Point with a number of cadets and some colleagues from the chemistry department is we've been actually formulating gunpowder according to these medieval recipes and then testing them with laboratory equipment and also with range test with a replica early 15th century gun to see whether the changes do cause a improvement or degradation or make no difference at all. That's what you'll see in a lot of the historiography about this. A lot of it was written by chemists, actually, who got interested in the history uh, rather than historians who got interested in the chemistry. And they tend to say things like, oh, well, this would have no effect. But actually, we have shown for sure with the uh, differential scan calorimetry that nice. it does make a difference. <laughs> now, whether it makes a difference that improves the performance in a practical way is something that's a lot harder to get at. We need to do more tests than we've been able to do. And it's complicated by the fact that so the tendency is to think of gunpowder as it's either better or worse, but it's not. It, different recipes are different, and different might be better for one gun and worse for another gun. So the early guns have very short barrels, so the higher proportion of sulfur seems to activate the ignition faster, and so it would make sense. We haven't really demonstrated this yet with the field testing yet. But it would make sense that that actually is advantageous in a short-barreled gun to have the reaction accelerated by the higher proportion of sulfur or, for example, by the mixing in. There's a bunch of, of stuff they mix in like amber that they mixed in. And I was like, oh, that even I was like, oh, that can't really be relevant, right? Amber. Mm -hmm. But I thought, well, I want to try it, right? And so I, I looked around to see if I could find some some amber, powdered amber, to put into the gunpowder. And I, I haven't actually tried it yet with the gunpowder. But what I did find is that the place you can buy it is on Etsy, where people sell it for pagan fire ceremonies. So I said, what? And it turns <laughs> out that if you throw it into fire, it makes like this big puff of, of flame. And of course, if you think about it, amber is just dried sap, right? Basically, sap is a hydrocarbon. So it actually makes sense. And apparently, I, I'm looking, that's one of the ones I'm really looking forward to trying because I think that is actually going to work. And there, I have several gunpowder recipes where amber is an ingredient. Yeah. Even though obviously that would be expensive, but it would be expensive. I'm wondering, as you're mentioning, there's all sorts of different additives added to the gunpowder. Do right. you find that they, are related to like humoral theory so things like we need to make this hotter and so it, yeah. it might be something that's not necessarily hotter in chemistry but it's hotter in humoral theory right you would expect that but no i i don't think so they seem to be trying it based on trial and error in most cases so, for example, they'll use, instead of using water, they'll use brandy as a mixing agent, which does actually make a difference. Sometimes they use varnish, which also actually is an accelerant. So one, one of the, the recommended in one manuscript that it recommends, well, you can use brandy or the urine of a wine drinking man. <laughs> have and you tried first, that? That's, I have not tried that one. Yeah. <laughs> but at first that seems crazy, but actually there are nitrates in urine. And in fact, you increase the amount of nitrates in your urine if you drink wine. So it's not at all crazy to think that that might actually be a relevant factor, but it wouldn't make sense in terms of humoral theory. <laughs>
Right. Well, I mean, yeah. wine drinking men are not in short supply in the army. It's a cheap, <laughs> cheap resource. <laughs> That's awesome. So what are you using as a projectile for these experiments? Uh, stone balls. So it turns out you can get great stone cannonballs from Crate and Barrel. <laughs> Are those those ones you put in a decorative basket? <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. But but bigger ones, right? So actually they're more for lawn ornament type things. Right. But yeah, they're they're 10 centimeter stone balls. And we knew that was going to be a problem. So when we had our replica cannon made, we basically were copying an existing gun, but we adjusted the size a little bit in proportion to match those cannonballs because we knew we could get them and otherwise it was going to be a big pain. <laughs> <laughs> the Hundred Years War, brought to you by Crate and Bear. Crate and Bear. I, I keep meaning to leave a product review and say how great they are at <laughs> maintaining airspeed velocity as they fly from a, a Steinbuchse. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that must be interesting. You know, you get a receipt for the United States Military Academy from Crate and Bear. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So what are you hoping that the cadets will learn from these particular experiments? Because you say you're working with cadets to put these mm -hmm. recipes together. What are you hoping that they will learn from these experiments? Well, this project was initiated really by a cadet, by Cadet Bob Seals, now a lieutenant. And so he was a historian and it was his senior thesis that kind of got us launched on this project. So he was learning about the history of artillery and learning about how to construct a hypothesis about history and then use experimental archaeology to test the validity of it. The cadets who are working on it now are actually mostly chemists. So they're learning how to use a differential scan calorimeter and a bomb calorimeter and how to interpret the results and uh, actually, we had a, a mechanical engineering cadet who designed the carriage, essentially, because each time we've taken it out to test it, we've destroyed the carriage. <laughs> so we haven't gotten off our full day of shooting because each time we, uh, the carriage doesn't stand up to the strength of the explosions. You need to make a deal with the devil so you can shoot three times in a day. <laughs> I'm not sure it's worth it for that. Oh, Okay. <laughs> Well, I mean, in the end, the result that you found was that medieval people knew what they were doing and that they were making these adjustments intentionally, right? So that's what I would like to find. I'm, <laughs> oh, I thought I'm that's not what sure. you did find. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not sure we actually, in some respects, yes, but in some respects, we don't have enough data yet to really mm -hmm. be sure that that is actually true. And of course, it's probably not always true, right? Probably right. some of the things they did were counterproductive. Or even if good weren't as good as they said they were. But it's really tough because we know they did it right, right? Because they had lots of practice. So if we yeah. get a result that is less than we expected, like the additive really sort of didn't seem to make any particular difference in the firing test, we can see that it does make a difference in the, in the lab tests. But if it doesn't seem to make a test a difference in the field test, we don't know if that's because we didn't really pack it properly or we can't use their ignition method because it's not safe enough. We have to be farther away from the gun. Mm -hmm. So they, the way they would do it is they would use sort of like a fireplace poker, you know, the kind that's, that's a right angle. Mm -hmm. So they would heat up the right angle point in a, a brazier and then put that at the touch hole. And that actually transfers a lot of heat. We use a, basically a rocket launcher fuse <laughs> because we can wire that and stand at a safe distance. So that probably throws off our results at least somewhat. But what we definitely have found out is that our little gun puts out a lot of power, uh, you know, that it'll throw a stone much faster than a crossbow bolt. And since it's much heavier with just way more energy than a crossbow bolt and any knight even in the best plate armor who got hit by that stone ball was gonna die mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well i mean we wouldn't have stuck with the gun if it didn't work <laughs> to some extent that, that, right? that is true yeah <laughs> which brings me to what you're talking about at kalamazoo this year which was we already apply medieval principles for like historical principles for coming at a battle site reading the text deciding what is worth 
taking in what is worth ignoring. But you were mentioning military principles from history also need to be applied. So what did you mean by that? I mean, I listened, I know, but <laughs> for the audience. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what I meant by that was that when you're trying to interpret a medieval battle, which is what the, the paper was about, and, and particularly one of the few where we can actually study it on the battle site because we know the battle site well enough, that it's tough to first to understand what happened because you have to deal with sources that don't agree with each other or don't tell you everything you want to know, or both usually. So historians have applied the techniques of medieval history source criti criticism and evaluation and just making sure they're translating the old French correctly or the Latin and things like that and use those same techniques, the same kind of training, and yet come to very conflicting, uh, contradictory explanations of what happened at the battle. And most people who write on medieval military history have been trained either as medieval historians or as military historians, but not both. So for example, there are only very few of us who have taught a medieval history survey and a military history survey. And so some of the people who've written about, say, the Battle of Poitiers, for example, which is what my paper was on, have been retired colonels who are serious and they, they read a lot and they maybe even read the French and the Latin, but they haven't had that full training and they don't have that breadth of knowledge about culture and social pressures and deference and things like that that affect how a medieval historian would read the sources and interpret them. But on the other hand, the ones who do know about chivalry and social pressure and deference and so on don't always really understand some things that people who've studied battles all the way from the ancient Egyptians through the 21st century know that it's just this is just a a constant in military history that and especially that you know there are fewer things that are still constant after the French Revolution but there are lots of things that are pretty constant whenever you're dealing with human bodies and handheld muscle powered missile weapons right they're just things that work and things that don't work. So you find very similar solutions to a lot of tactical problems that you can find in Tang China or Byzantium or classical Greece or the Middle Ages. Things like how many ranks deep can archers stand and still be able to shoot at their targets effectively? Or how tight do formations need to be? Is a formation going to be one man per three foot of frontage in front or five or six or two or what? Three is, is the most common answer, three or a little less. So if you don't know those things, you may say, oh, well, they probably, you know, arranged their formation from here to here on the map. And then if you just do the math with the number of people that is and the frontage and the number of ranks, a military historian says, no, that, that doesn't work. They won't fit there uh, or they, they won't reach from one end of that area to the other. And, and that'll leave their flanks open. And a military historian knows that if you're, especially if you're a as the English pretty much always are in the Hundred Years' War, a badly outnumbered force planning to fight on foot, your number one priority tactically is to protect your flanks with some sort of terrain obstacle, because otherwise the French will just send the cavalry around and uh, hit you from the side and behind, and, and you'll lose. So, and correct me if I'm wrong, we should be assuming, or at least giving the benefit of the doubt to people from the past for survival instinct or training or just smart street smarts? What should we be kind of giving the benefit of the doubt about? Yeah, I think experience. The commanders of the Middle Ages rarely rose to positions of command without having started out in a court right? Yeah. I mean, you, you, Joan of Arc, I guess, is an exception, but there aren't <laughs> very many exceptions. And in fact, you know, most of them were not just in courts, but were highly placed in courts and sort of grew up expecting to be military leaders. 
And, you know, if you know that's going to be your job, you, you, you listen to people who've done it. And the people who've done it want to tell you about it because you're the future leader. And so they actually had a really good knowledge of the military past and of what works and of, you know, war stories, not necessarily histories, maybe war stories, but also histories. There's a number of people, William the Conqueror, Robert Guiscard, Charlemagne even, specifically described in our sources as liking to listen to audiobooks your courtiers reading the tales of the ancient Romans from Valerius Maximus or Suetonius or the romances of those things, right? Of course, they had the romances of Charlemagne in the late Middle Ages and the romances of Troy. And some of those were very heavy fictionalized, very <laughs> heavily fictionalized. But the people who wrote them often had a didactic element intended, uh, and certainly, even if not, were trying for verisimilitude, right? So they tended to be people who followed the wars, right? Your heralds and people like Fantome, who maybe acted as messengers, Chandos Herald did that too, and were often present at battles because they had to be watching out for who performed gloriously and who didn't and helping commanders say, oh, you know, over on that flank, you have those four lords, as mm -hmm. I can tell by the banners, because I know the heraldry. Mm -hmm. And so they they kind of knew what a battle was actually like. And so when they were making up a battle, they made it realistic. And you could actually learn about tactics and about how to fight a battle from a well-made-up battle as well as you could from a real one. It makes a lot of sense. And I'm thinking as you're talking about this, that you're putting in a lot of reps if you're going to be at the right. front of a battle. So you know how much elbow room you need. But I think it's important right. to think about these people as commanding unblooded troops, for example, peasants who might be called up, but they would still understand how to form them, right? Sure. And of course, Unblooded peasants are are not much use, and you're likely to just leave them. <laughs> really, you're you're likely to leave them behind. But we do have accounts, like for example, more in the Scandinavian context, where they were more infantry and commoner focused. And so we have accounts uh, from the the sagas and things like that of kings and leaders, you know, walking along the lines and sh showing men how to hold their axe and how to put their shoulder behind the the shield and so on, and if you're forming a shield wall, that makes it pretty easy to understand what your formation is supposed to be. But they will say things, uh, and I've got a bunch about this in my book on soldiers' lives in the Middle Ages. There's a whole chapter about battle describing how standards, in other words, banners, were used as instruments of tactical control. And one of the things they would say to the soldiers as they're stationing them is, pay attention to where your banner is. If it moves, you move don't get farther from it, don't get in front of it. And then when when the commander wants to advance the formation, he'll say banner advance, the banner will tip at an angle so everybody can see it, the horns will blow, which tells everybody look to see what the banner's doing. And then the banner moves forward and everybody just basically stays in line. The front rank stays in line with the banner and then the next rank stays in formation with the front rank and so on. And the whole formation does move as more or less a rectangle generally. And sometimes some historians have sort of poo-pooed the maps that you'll see of medieval battles where they have sort of neat rectangles moving from place to place and like, oh, medieval formations weren't that regular. And you, you know, this is not a Napoleonic drilled force and so on. But actually still, you know, if you've got a shield wall and it's, you know, five ranks deep, the rectangle is not the worst way to show that. Yes, it'll be, you'll, it'll be more a little of a curve, probably depending on the terrain, but yeah, a rectangle's not so bad. Well, and I mean, the people there are invested in not dying, so they're going to do what they're told, right? Absolutely, yeah. And that's part of every commander, every chronicler describes anyway. Every commander at the beginning of the battle is always giving a harangue to the troops, right? A speech to the troops. And that's one of the elements that you, you see uh, very often in these speeches where they say, hey, you came here for various reasons, but now you're fighting because, yes, you're fighting for your wives and your children and to protect your homeland. You're also fighting because if you don't win, you'll probably die. 
because casualties were extremely lopsided in medieval battles. Mm -hmm. It's not like a modern battle where you're basically throwing lead at each other for hours, right? Which tends to result in high casualties on both sides. In medieval battles, particularly if it's fighting on foot, losses could be devastating on the losing side and actually very low, fit like 1% or less uh, of the winners dying. So that would be part of the pitch is, you know, if you stay in formation, keep your eye on your banner, you'll win. And if you win, you won't die and you'll become rich. <laughs> yes. uh, so that's a, that's a pretty good pitch. <laughs> so get out there, boys. So in your book on soldiers' lives, what did you think was important to put in there to give people a sense of a soldier's life? What elements did you think were important to put in there? I sort of took a chronological approach, not in the sense of moving from the early Middle Ages to the late Middle Ages, but sort of a generalized chronology of what it was like to go on campaign. So it starts with getting your equipment together and then marching to join an army and then what it would be like to arrive at an army where it's probably more people than you've ever seen before, but that includes you know, people you were at court as a foster brother with and somebody you campaigned with you know, in a previous campaign that you haven't seen for years. And there's all kinds of people knowing that a whole bunch of money is coming together in that army. And so they're selling shields and, and they're selling horses. You, you see the biggest variety of horses you've ever seen, which you care about if you're a medieval soldier. And, you know, fancy tents that look like that have been painted to look like castles, and some of which are almost the size of small castles. And then you move to the enemy frontier and you move into the enemy territory and now you start plundering and how does plundering work and how do you supply yourself and what ha what happens to prices as the land gets eaten up, but then a big convoy comes in with a bunch of sheep that they took from a monastery and the price of sheep goes way down and everybody's <laughs> eating mutton. You run out of beer, so you have to drink water and you're you're worried about that because that's obviously very bad for your health, which actually it is because wine is a really good, which is what they preferred to drink, uh, and they would mix it with water. But wine, when you mix it with water, is actually a very effective antibacterial so that's what they would do. But if they ran out, then they're just drinking straight water. They tend to get sick. So from there, you move to what's it like to conduct a siege? What's it like to fight an actual battle? What happens after the battle with the cleaning up the battlefield, but also the pursuit of the enemy and dealing with the casualties? And then I sort of wrap it all up with looking in detail at the career of a particular medium-level soldier and the various things that he experienced and how that's an illustration of the big generalizations with lots of specific uh, anecdotes of all sort of the different phases of campaigning that I've gone through in the in the previous chapters. I think that's a really great way of looking at it, that human on the ground sort of look at it. And I think that is perfect for the people listening to this podcast. I think there will be a lot of interest in this book. I'm interested in this book. I'm going to have to get a <laughs> copy of it. Okay, so before I let you go, I need to ask you an important question. And that is, why does West Point need a medieval historian on staff? Why is it important to the mm. modern military to have a medievalist? Well, of course, West Point is a, a four-year undergraduate institution. It's not like Sandhurst in Britain, where most of the officer candidates already have degrees. So partly it's just a matter of having a well-rounded history department, right? So every well-educated person should at least have the opportunity to take a course in medieval history, <laughs> if not necessarily have done it. But I would argue that the elective I teach on ancient and medieval warfare is actually one of the best for training modern officers of any history course. And there are two reasons for that. One is because if you only study modern history, you don't get nearly as good a sense of what things are genuinely timeless versus the things that seem that way if you look, if timeless only extends to 50 years. It's unlikely that tomorrow's soldiers are going to be facing longbowmen, <laughs> but they may very well be facing a force that has figured out a new way to fight really effectively that they've never seen before and that they can't exactly emulate because it wouldn't work 
for their social context. So what do you do about that? Mm -hmm. So that's the first reason. But the second and the more important one is that the mists of time are the best analog for the fog of war. So as officers in a combat situation, and Clausewitz is really good on this, by the way, officers face the very, very difficult problem of knowing that they have to make decisions that are based on information from fragmentary sources, conflicting sources, obviously incomplete sources. They can't have all the information they want. They can't go get all the information that they want before they make their decision. And medieval historians and ancient historians, more than modern historians, face that same basic problem. Fragmentary, conflicting information with lots of big gaps in it that you nonetheless have to and can, with the right habits of mind and approaches, put together into a story or an understanding. And so the exercise of doing that helps prepare officers both to be better at figuring out how to deal with the conflicts and the information, but also to be more comfortable with reaching conclusions when they know how flawed and incomplete the sources that they can work with are. That is a really great answer to that question. <laughs> One I hadn't considered about applying practice in filling gaps and making good conclusions or at least yeah. educated guesses. But yeah, I think that you're absolutely right about that. And it is a valuable skill. And it's good to know that we have valuable skills as medievalists, right? <laughs> well, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you, Cliff. Thank you so much for coming on and telling us all about canons and medieval history in general. My pleasure, Danielle. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's going on, Peter? Hey, hey. Well, there's some medieval news involving millions and millions of dollars. I love that. Tell yeah. us all about it. Yeah. First, the uh, Codex Sassoon. It's a, like a late 9th, early 10th century Hebrew Bible. And so that manuscript just got sold at auction at Sotheby's for $38 million. Wow. To a private collector, I'm assuming? Well, it is a private collector did buy it, but he's donating it to a museum in Israel. So, well, that's awesome. That is yeah. a good news story. Yeah, that is really cool. So, this is the most valuable manuscript ever sold at auction. Wow. Wow. And a donation to boot. That's awesome. So, we've got that. Plus, we have news from Cairnafor Castle in Wales, and they just finished a $5 million project to allow access into its main gatehouse. So, for the first time in centuries, Apparently, people can go onto its floors and even into its roof and check out brand new views. That's one of those impressive castles built by Edward I. Yes, I absolutely love those Welsh castles. They're gorgeous. So people are spending millions of dollars on the Middle Ages still. <laughs> I'm happy to hear that because the more that is invested, the more we can all learn together. So that's awesome. Indeed, indeed. So we have that. Plus, we have some features on like, did medieval physicians try to learn new things? Or did they just rely on ancient writers? Spoiler, they, they did use experiments and clinical research kind of things. So this so was pretty cool. And we also have a story of a girl buried in ancient Rome, who was discovered in the 15th century. Wow. It, it, it was it was at all the talk of the town for a few days. <laughs> Yeah, I bet there was a lot that was discovered in this grave. That's awesome. And it's nice to see sometimes archaeological digs happening in the Middle Ages of ancient graves. Oh, yes. All that and more. Well, thank you, Peter, for stopping by. It sounds like you have great stuff on the website this week. Thanks. Episode 200 is coming up next week, so it's time to ask for your opinion. Head over to daniellesabolski.com slash the hyphen medieval hyphen podcast to vote for your favorite episodes, topics, and guests, and to leave a comment if you have a kind message for one of my guests that you'd like me to read out on the show. I'll be recording on Tuesday, May 30th, so get your votes in by Monday night. The place to be is daniellesabolski.com slash the hyphen medieval hyphen podcast. I'm looking forward to tallying up the votes. This week on my new podcast, Extra Medieval, I'll be sharing a few other interesting nuggets about warfare in the 14th century, as well as an assassin's plot from a few hundred years earlier, aimed at the legendary leader Saladin. Extra Medieval is a show I've created just for subscribers where I get to expand on the topics covered on the Medieval podcast, as well as tell you about new articles, historical tidbits, and even modern research. <laughs> 
Join me for Extra Medieval on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Patreon. And speaking of Patreon, thank you to everyone who supports this podcast, as well as other indie podcasters and historians through Medievalist.net's Patreon page. Patrons can access all sorts of awesome stuff like subscriptions to the Medieval Magazine and Medieval World Magazine, as well as ad-free versions of this podcast and Extra Medieval. To get in on all the action, please visit patreon.com slash medievalists. For everything from guns to nuns, follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sapolsky, on social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books at all your favorite bookstores, where you can get hold of How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life, in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. You can even pre order my new book, Chivalry and Courtesy Medieval Manners for a Modern World, which comes out in September. And don't forget to vote on episode 200, daniellesapolsky.com slash the hyphen medieval hyphen podcast. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. Thanks for listening and have yourself an amazing day. Mm-hmm.